All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming by and thanks to CJ and Dave for joining me here. How you doing guys? You hang, hanging in there, trying to stay busy? Doing great. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, we do have a question and answer box here. If you guys want to type in questions, uh, please do so. We'll, uh, we'll get to some stuff later on. But in the spirit of keeping this uh, happy and positive, uh, we're not going to sit here and talk about uh, the current state of the industry. Um, if you're watching this in replay, we're in the middle of this coronavirus epidemic and uh, hopefully uh, we'll all be out, out and working again here pretty soon. But uh, in this current state, we're going to talk about stuff that might be helpful for us when we get back to working. So we just, we decided we'd take this webinar and discuss different mixing tips for different sized venues. All three of us have done everything from touring in tiny vans, doing small clubs, uh, all the way up to doing arena sized shows. So. Um, Let's start with the small clubs. Uh, first of all, David, what, what was your very first like tour? Was it a van tour? Was it a small club tour? Uh, so anyone that knows me, I'm from Australia. Touring there is right. similar, a little different to here. It mostly involves like you get in a van and drive overnight 12 hours from one city to another when you first start off. Um, the first tour I was on was pretty interesting uh, in that it happened in another disaster time <laughs> and the entire city of Brisbane flooded. So uh, I was touring with a band from Michigan called La Dispute and some friends of mine uh, in a band called To The North who were from Brisbane and they got me on that tour and we had to, our first show was in Sydney. We had to leave uh, day earlier than we planned to escape the city before the whole city shut down from flooding which is an interesting backstory but basically it was uh yeah it was i mean it was a club tour it was vans um i remember getting into the first venue and it was a 450 cap venue and that was the biggest show i had done at the time and was just absolutely scared of <laughs> mixing in a venue that size which is funny look back on it now but it's, I don't know, in, in, if you're mixing rock bands at, in clubs, I feel like the general aim was just to make it loud and make people feel something. And the kind of, if, if I go into a club, uh, the general, I guess, vibe of what I'm trying to get out of a mix is it's not necessarily meant to sound like a record because it's not going to sound like a record. Uh, it's not meant to sound necessarily pristine. It's to make people feel something. So that's usually just, you know, you want people to feel the kick drum in their chest, like feel the bass. Um, it's not going to be as clean and nice sounding as, as it is in an arena or amphitheater. And so that's the general, uh, I guess, approach I take to clubs. Yeah, well, I guess the, the classical definition of what we do in live sound is sound reinforcement. I exactly think especially true when we're talking about small clubs when, yeah and it's when, it's you know, you know you're not going to get everything you're going to be fighting a losing battle if you try and get every single thing above you know the volume that's happening on stage if you have a live drummer and you're trying to make everything louder than the drums like you're just going to punish people with volume and it's not going to sound good anyway and you usually don't have in the smaller clubs the pa systems to be able to really good stuff anyway so exactly fall yeah. apart pretty quickly but <laughs> yeah cj what was your what was your first tour uh mixing uh front of house and was it was it a van tour was your what was yeah it? it was i was a tm front of house for a band from canada called down with webster <clears throat> and we were supporting uh some act from new york called time flies we were doing probably like you know, a thousand cap clubs or something like that, but we were the support band. Um, and so similar to what Dave's saying, you know, you're, you know, I'm the TM, the driver, the backline guy, the front of house guy doing monitors from front of house. So it's, it was, uh, it was definitely kind of like a through the ringer, get thrown in the fire kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, which definitely makes you better when you kind of have to wear all those hats and do all, all those jobs and stuff like that. But it is, um, it is very grueling having to, you know, drive 500 miles straight into sound check and then, and then kind of off you go. But um, yeah, especially, especially in those clubs, like you were saying, PAs don't, 
you're not like in an arena setting looking to cover everything. There's not going to be like ideal speaker coverage or, you know, or if there's different zones because of weird venues with low ceilings in certain spots and stuff like that, you know, you walk around the room and it sounds different. So really you kind of just have to quickly get, quickly get things sounding loud and proud, like Dave said, without it being too phasey, but at the same time, it's, you know, really, especially if you don't have any time to sound check and you're just line checking, um, you know, it's really just kick drum and vocal and everything else go from there. Yeah, I, I think that really, especially understanding that things don't sound the same in most small clubs everywhere in the room, I think is one of the biggest mixing tips I always give people. It's like, just move away from the board, step away, just hear how it sounds in other, in other places in the room. You gotta, you gotta kind of take a walk sometimes. Mixed, totally. mixed positions can be so tough in small rooms. You're often in the back corner totally. or you're yeah, up in a booth or something and it can be it can be tough to understand what it sounds like right in, in the seats i feel like when i first started like running mixing shows i was just kind of running back and forth so mm -hmm. much until i kind of understood how things translated it took a while yeah yeah and yeah. it's i i think i think that's probably i think you hit the nail on the head there that's probably the biggest thing is to step away from the board go and walk the room and see how different people like how it sounds different in different places in the room because it sounds completely different everywhere you go. Like nothing even it, sometimes it doesn't even sound like you're in the same venue if right. you know, walking from front to back side to side, like there might be, you know, there might be like an elevated area up here and then you go down a couple of steps and all the guitars that you hear from stage that were, you could hear two feet up here are suddenly like not, you, they they just all disappear or something, and you kind of have to find that balance between what's too loud for the people up here and what's too quiet for there. But the point sort of gets across to the audience of what's happening. Yeah, um, I guess one thing I want to talk about uh, during this conversation is using subs on an aux. Uh, I, I know it's I I almost always do it. Um, I know different people have different methods. Some people use matrices. And, and so forth, but I feel like that's less important in smaller clubs. Um, do you guys agree or? Yeah, it's, I totally agree. I mean, I think um, like a good, a good example is to anyone who's ever been to Music Hall at Williamsburg, um, you know, a lot of their venues, same with Bowery and stuff like that, you know, usually they're just all left, right. Um, and, you know, really without having to and kind of the kind of the cool thing being an audio engineer working through smaller clubs is you're on a bunch of different desks and a bunch of different PA systems. There's nothing consistent, but you get to kind of like learn what you like and what you don't. And people do have different systems set up and stuff. But but really, if it's like you need more subs, then send some more low end to the subs, kind of thing. And instead of you know actually just mixing it in on an aux. Um, so just like yeah. using, using the channel EQ more than. Yeah, exactly. Kind of a, a separate send. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I feel that works better in most small clubs. Again, because the subs sound different a lot of times in different parts. Totally. Of the um, I feel like when you yeah we get up to bigger systems, uh, things can get a little easier and maybe more. Uh, I don't know, better distributed all those sub frequencies, especially. I think the low end is kind of one of the toughest things in different different rooms, but. It does definitely get better in, I don't know, a little bit bigger clubs, mid-sized clubs. To me, right. that's kind of like the, the sweet spot. Yeah, I, you I mentioned agree. music hall, mm -hmm. but kind of like 600 to 1500 seat clubs um, mm -hmm. to where if you have a, like a nice system in there, that can be some of the most fun mixing. Yeah, I agree. Exactly. Um, and I think a lot of that is because a lot of times if you get just enough that, that much room, they're, they start to put the sound booth in kind of like better spots in the room and it, it tend to be fun. Yeah, uh, and even, you know, sub frequencies specifically in smaller clubs, like you're, you're, we were just talking about, you know, being tucked in a corner somewhere or up high in a booth and stuff like that. You could be in the corner where all you hear is bass and then you walk to the middle and it's just all high end because you're kind of just taking it out from where you're listening from. Yeah. And same thing with subs. I mean, sometimes you're like, I don't hear anything. And then you walk you know, to the sweet spot in the center where the audience is and you're just getting pummeled with kick yeah. drum, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 
and totally, I, I agree with Scott here in the chat. You know, it 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 does offer you more control. So if, if you're comfortable doing that, it, it's it's totally good to do. I just I feel like really when you get up into like the the thousand plus rooms, that's where you really kind of want that very detailed control over the, yeah. the subset subsend. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll add in that I'm I'm not a fan of subs on ox in in general. So so uh, <laughs> so one one thing I'll and we can talk about this throughout different size venues, but. I mean, I've noticed more maybe that Americans uh, use a sub on an aux more than Australians and people from the UK. <laughs> I, I'm just saying most most Isn't engineers that I know in the UK kind of have maybe a more old school approach of using matrices. It's a separate send you still, but not not a sure. Yeah, I, have, you, have you found that to be true, or am I just imagining that? <laughs> I I haven't done the research behind it, so right. I'll take your word. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Okay. Um, all right. So, but. Before we move on from small clubs, any any tips on maybe like treat, treating vocals? Um, I, I guess a lot of times in small clubs, you're on we're doing wedges to maybe even mixing monitors from front of house. Any mm -hmm. things you can think of? I, one thing I like to do a lot in small clubs is use a high pass filter uh, pretty aggressively. Um, mm -hmm. And just so that so what's coming out of the PA can be more reinforcement sound and actually just more low end mud that's coming off the stage but it, like any tips maybe on how to treat vocals in small clubs uh don't don't over compress because you're just yeah. going to end up uh really bringing the stage volume into the mic and then i've fallen into that trap a bunch of times uh when i started out with over compressing and then you know like the the band will stop playing the music will stop and then you just start the wedge just starts feeding back like crazy. Mm. So yeah, uh, that can be a, a losing battle if you're trying to, you know, I mean, if the PA is not loud enough and you're just trying to get more volume by compressing it, it's a losing battle. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, yeah, over compressing can be hard, but I mean, high pass filter is definitely your friend and, and that's kind of, and it can be fun when you're in different rooms and like I said, on different consoles. Um, you know, you can see what you can get away with a little more. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's helpful, but if I'm if I'm doing a, you know, a smaller show, like 300 cap monitors are from front of house, usually wedges in those clubs are so beaten and have so many beers poured on them. You know, they already sound muffled as it is. But, um, you know, we have to make the artists feel comfortable and the musicians feel comfortable on stage. So I really approach it. Let me try and get this vocal sounding good in the wedge and then I'll deal with it at front of house. Because if you do it backwards, you're like, oh, that sounds cool at front of house. Then you start bringing it in and it starts taking off and feeding back. Then you're just then you're just kind of fighting yourself from there. So, I mean, I said job number one is making the artist feel comfortable and the lead singer. So if you can get it sounding good in the wedge and then you just deal with what you have beyond that at front of house, um, that's, that's how I approach it. Or a, a great thing I, I used to do as well is it's super easy on digital kernels to duplicate your input to a separate channel. Sure. But I used to carry um, like a just a straight XLR Y split with me as well. So I'd wire that into two channels in the back of the console. And one would be a front of house uh, vocal uh, channel and the other would be for monitors as well you process them both it, differently so um yeah, yeah I, I was i was going to bring this up because i do the same thing uh can you explain dave why that's good to do rather than just duplicating the channel um well for, for two reasons a because you can some of that like i was talking about over compressing even though that's still a thing at front of house it's less critical if you can split it from the wedge so you can add a little more compression at front of house than you might in the wedge. Uh, you can EQ things a little differently, like a lot of those small club uh, wedges. And it's, I mean, it's getting better now because you, um, you know, I, I notice now like clubs have, they're more likely to have some like DNB wedges or something like that. But yeah. if you get into places where it's just, you know, like, if they've had beer spilled on them, their frequency response is not flat. It's peaking everywhere. They sound harsh. Um, you want to take that stuff out of the wedge and, but not a front of house because you want it to cut or the vocalist might want, you know, they might want to hear more low end in the wedge so they can feel their voice coming back to them. And, you know, they've got 
the drums are like three feet behind him. So adding a ton of high end isn't going to do anything because it's not going to cut through the cymbals. So they might want to have more of that low mid in there where that just muddies it up in the house. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, going back to the, just taking care of the lead vocals first, you know, if you have two separate channels and you're not duplicating them on the digital console, you do have separate gain control. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the things I had trouble learning when I was first learning about digital consoles way a long time ago. But if you duplicate, if you duplicate the channel or use two the same input for right. two channels, yeah. right. usually the the gain. If you adjust the gain on one channel, it's going to adjust the gain on the other. So yeah, yeah. Like I the same thing. I used to do Y split them so then I could take the monitor channel, get a good gain, and just make the sure the monitor is totally set right. and, mm -hmm. and and happy so that when they walk on stage they can play and then could have separate gain control, separate compression control, and everything over the front of house channel. So. That's, that's definitely a, a great thing to do in small clubs. So, um, I mean, sometimes if I have enough time, I'll actually duplicate like kick drum channels too, sure. or um, not even necessarily Y split everything, but actually duplicate the channel to a separate channel. So you can compress more, the drums more for the front of house mix and not mm -hmm. have compressed send for the, for the monitors, but uh, great tips for, for small clubs. Um, so we're talking about medium-sized clubs being kind of ideal. Do you guys have a favorite ones? Um, union transfer, baby. I was just going to say union <laughs> transfer is one of, the, one of the most fun. CJ, you used to, you used to live in Philadelphia. That's, yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the all-around best clubs in the country, for sure. So you guys are living in LA right now. What's, uh, what's your favorite kind of mid-sized club over there? Hmm. I've done a, show, a couple of shows at Terragram recently. Anybody, anybody in the chat have a have a favorite I'm, LA club? I, I love Terragram. Terragram's cool. Um, uh, Will Turn is, can be a bit of a challenge, but it's a, I think it's a beautiful place to see a show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, when we do start getting up in like Will Turn size venues, we start to get like, I mean, I, I, that's a theater, right? Mm -hmm. that, it's like 2000 yeah. cap, is that right? Yeah, like a small theater, yeah. Small theater. yeah. So, I mean, it's theaters, maybe 2,000 to 5,000 cap. Uh, I've, I've done a ton of, like, for some reason, a lot of the bands I've done seem to do a lot of this touring. I've done a lot of them, but it's a whole separate set of issues, right? Um, number one, mix position. Yeah. Under, ba under balcony can be tough. A lot of those theaters <laughs> have those balconies. Can you guys talk about tips you might have if, you're, if you do have to be, be under a balcony and try to get a, get a mix going? Well, I, I think typically by um that time you'll uh either have pretty solid rehearsals with a band or you've been going with them for a while and have a pretty solid show file so i tend to take the approach that the show file is good the mix is good um when you get out and tune the pa make sure that you're doing that from out under the balcony and when you line check, make sure you're walking the room, uh, make sure it sounds good in different places. And, you know, especially out from under the balcony and then just sort of, I guess, turn the turn a little part of your brain off that is trying to critique things of how it sounds from under the balcony and understand that it sounds, you know, th there's not a lot you can do with how that sounds sometimes. And that for the people that are hearing the PA in full range, like they're going to have a better experience and mix, you know, mix accordingly. It's, <laughs> you got to draw a fine line in there because sometimes you just can't do anything. If you're, if you are carrying a PA and you can get in, um, then you have a, a better chance of dealing with that because you can either have a PA tech hang the PA lower or, add some extra fills onto the stage to try and shoot under the balcony, which can help some of that. But um, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Also, yeah, I mean, see if you can tie into venue systems as well. A lot of those theaters will have little, um, like just small little kind of fills under the balcony, mm -hmm. uh, one or two rows of them that they don't sound good on their own, but they can add a little bit of that, uh, that top end that's missing from under the balcony yeah and those those are those are a really hard one with the under the balcony speakers especially from usually if you're in the mix position you know there might be 
there might be speakers right here next to you that are almost like, you know, a PA in itself because that information is getting to you quicker than the actual PA is. So it, it can kind of mess with you a little bit. So that's that's a hard one for me is is fine tuning level wise where those things should live. So the people under the balcony are getting the information, but it's not, you know, either throwing them off or throwing you off, you know, with your delay times and arrivals and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I mean, if, if you get in there early enough, you can go and time those to the, to the main PA. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've definitely had times when I go in and, and there's a pre-installed system. A lot of times on those theater tours, you're not really bringing a PA system in. It can be, uh, it's usually using whatever PA systems in there um, unless you have really big budget, but that's, that's another thing. But, um, but yeah, like a lot of times you have to go through and listen to the delay speakers under the balcony or off to the side, or if there's some other kind of spot. And a lot of times they're just not, the delay times aren't right. You have to go through and listen and make sure that whoever installed the PA system really did it a, a decent job. And mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it does take a little bit of attention for sure. I've, I've, I've gone in places that that's so far off. It's like, how do you guys not have this fixed? But you never know, right? Unless, unless yeah. you're carrying your own PA, it's, it's, you kind of at the, at the mercy of whatever's in there. Yeah. And theaters, I mean, theaters can be super challenging too, because I mean, you know, a lot of the super old ones, you know, they were really designed to project without loudspeakers, you know, for whatever musicians or big bands on stage and stuff like that. So the rooms are naturally just loud um for who anyone who's ever been to is it the, the Fox Argon in, in in chicago which Ar one Ar Argon? Oh, the, Ar the aragon yeah oh yeah man that place is so loud and so you're just and there's a lot of rooms just like it where you're just walking a fine line of it just being way too loud and you know you're just you're just really just fighting reverberation you know so people in an empty room like obviously people come in and soak it up that's the what every audio guy loves to tell the artist, oh, it'll sound better once, once. Before. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but uh, like, <laughs> you know, walking the Aragon's funny because, well, there's a old school Chicago uh, union crew guy, Jolly, who Jolly. is there. He's, he's awesome. Um, but he loves bringing the, the front of house engineer for whatever band's coming in right to the middle of the room because you can just yeah. clap and it just goes and there's like a five second delay. <laughs> yeah. just like, how yeah. am I going to mix a show in here? He's, he's, yeah, done. he's like, I love, I love bringing audio engineers out here and showing them that it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough room. Yeah, it is. And, and they, like, they have a D and B J system in there. It's sound, yeah. like the PA sounds great, but yeah, it's just a, a hard room. It's a beautiful room, but it's, yeah. yeah, it's just a very loud room. And a lot of theaters are like that as well. And, and there's, there's different hotspot zones where it's like, it's just pummeling or fluttery or something like that in this area. And then everything just goes away if you walk six feet this way, you know, so it's, it's definitely hard to find that line. Do you think uh, modern PA technology is uh, solving the, those, those kind of acoustical problems better these days? I think, guys, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, you know, especially with, you know, I mean, think about a, a ground stack PA in a theater versus a line array, you know, there's so much more coverage options and how you hang it. Um, you know, the, the level of each box, you know, within certain zones and stuff like that. So I, I think it solves a lot of issues, you know, it's, I mean, but without treatment, you really can't completely solve a room, you know, in a lot of old theaters, they're so beautiful looking, you know, why would you want to tear something down or turn this beautiful iron piece into a sound panel or something like that? Um, that's, but that's also like the line arrays is so much more focused than a ground stack that I, I I feel like it makes that difference between when a room's empty and when people come in even more drastic, because if you're listening when the room's empty, you know, it's hitting the ground, it's hitting the back wall and all that, um, you know, it's hitting empty balcony seats. But once people come in, it's really focused on where the people are. So that absorption is much more drastic than a ground stack, which is just sort of like spitting sound out everywhere. Right. So, um, and hitting a lot more walls. So I, I, I think it's made a huge, huge difference. Yeah. And I feel like even like the modern processing and some of these PAs that, I don't know, so the, the high end PA manufacturers are, have been sorting out over the past few years, 
just whatever processing they're doing in, in their systems there, just how they're able to control where the sound is going, even without moving speakers, they're able to kind of steer right. it down a bit and uh, kind of really make sure they're not hitting any unnecessary surfaces and stuff. So hopefully uh, that technology keeps coming along and sounds better and better. I'm, I definitely, since when I started touring, my first shows in theaters like that, where it was ground stack PAs, it's night and day compared to back then, for sure. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, another thing I I always have trouble with in these size clubs is is subs. You know, subs are tough. I feel like when you're getting out of clubs and into the theaters, um, you know, you can and you're not have your you don't have your own PA and you're at the mercy of whatever PA is in there. Some people will have subs under the under the line arrays. Some people will have center sub. Uh, clusters. There are many different approaches, and I don't know. Everybody has different opinions about which one works best with which speakers. Uh, do you have a preferred kind of sub array arrangement for those type of rooms? Do you tend to like the center clusters more, or do you tend to like subs under line arrays? Either of you guys? Uh, for me, in all situations, if I can, you know, if if it's possible with the layout of a room, a mono cluster in the center is is always better. Um, I I think I mean I think that the difference once you go outdoors is more drastic with a left right versus a mono configuration. But I still think in, in every single room, anytime I've I've tried this, a, a mono cluster in the center, no matter whether you're doing you know end fire cardioid or just you know, whatever the configuration is, I've always found it to be more even coverage. Card cardioid, right? Yeah. Cardioid usually. Yeah. I mean, card cardioid is, is great because you can focus where the, the energy is going, but you know, no matter whether it's cardioid or, or not, like I much prefer subs in a, in a mono block in the center. Yeah. Uh, CJ, how are you, how are you generally running your subs on the Khalid tour? Well, we were messing with uh, sub arc delay for a little bit, um, and we've done center center cluster as well. Uh, but I think right now we're just doing yeah, just left right three subs up top, uh, three subs on the ground on each side. And um, you know, I know usually there's there's a little bit more summation, you know, and a lot of us call power alley in the middle of the room. It's like a lot more sub focus there so it's kind of it's kind of hard to balance that for everybody else on the sides and stuff like that um but that's what that's what i tend to love from the mix position i mean i think it should sound best at front of house and especially uh you know if you have managers and friends and family and and uh you know artists friends and stuff like that you know you need to make sure it sounds good out there and to me that's that's kind of like the easiest way to get there can you uh, can you explain the term power alley a little more for those who don't know? Um, well, I'll probably be horrible at explaining the science of it, but but basically the subs on the left right you know usually sum to the middle where um, you know the game doubles basically and and just kind of like creates a lot more sub energy in the middle if you're sitting you know if you're standing in between the speakers. Yeah, yeah, it can be uh, it can be disconcerting if you're doing a sound check and doing a show and you're standing in the power alley like in the middle of the room like where front of house usually is and then yeah. step 15 feet to the to the side and then all of a sudden you're like oh this does not sound like <laughs> yet another reason why you know stepping away from the console just to understand what's happening in other parts of the room is usually a good idea absolutely uh cj i i'm, I'm trying to remember most of uh your subs on that tour are coming from the flown subs behind the PA. Yeah. Right. And you're just using the center to cover the exactly. ground. Yeah. Just kind of tickling that in a little bit. Yeah. So I, I guess these uh, kind of theaters is where you might start to see some flown subs. Um, you know, Dave, can you explain why flown subs are a good idea or even the fact that people do fly subs? To those who might not be familiar, uh, I mean, f flown subs are great because 
I mean, for a start, you're not dealing with timing issues as much between the left and the right PA, but a lot of it is just to do with you get the sub energy away from the audience standing directly in, in front of the stage. I mean, you know, the majority of the audience, whether it's in a theater or an arena or wherever, they're standing, you know, anywhere between like what, 10 feet from the stage to 150 feet or more from the stage. So trying to have subs on the ground doing all the hard work means that you're either just going to kill the people in front of you or uh, the audience at the back aren't going to be able to hear the subs at all. So flying subs allows you to push out more energy from the sub that'll reach the back of the room and reach the people at the front of the stage in a more even manner. And then you usually just complement that with some subs on the ground to sort of fill in for, you know, the front of the audience and make sure that they're still able to feel it as well. Yeah, it really is the best way if you're in a room that can handle it, you know, or outside, definitely the best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's a game changer if you really want to have a full sounding mix everywhere in the room. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of critical, but. I mean, I, I guess let's start talking about arena sound. Um, cause that's, well, I just, just uh, yeah. before we get to arena, I, I, I guess this applies to arena as well. But one thing I love doing when tuning PAs is I love to spend a lot of time going to, you know, the top of the balcony, the shittiest part of the room and hearing how it sounds there because often I find that a lot of what might be detrimental to how a PA is tuned in the room in general is kind of, it's on steroids by the time you get to the top of the balcony, those worst spots of the room. So it's easier to go and find those detrimental frequencies there, you know, boost them, play around with like what's really resonating in the room and they just stand out like, crazy up there and that's um you know i i always understand that even coverage isn't uh possible in theaters and, and i mean really any venue to to a degree but it's not possible but you still try and give people the best chance of being able to hear clearly what's happening on stage so i i like finding those shitty frequencies in the worst parts of the venue taking them out and then going back down to uh, to the floor and seeing how it sounds and how that translates and taking that knowledge and sort of adjusting from that point. Yeah, I, I think it goes back to having, we were talking about this in a webinar last week about having a song that you really, really know well and you can, mm -hmm. that you can trust your ears and know what's exactly how the recording translates yeah. and be able to walk up to the top of the balcony and, and, and know that if you're hearing something weird in the 250 hertz range, Mm -hmm. That's not the song. It's not the what's coming out of the PA. It's the room, and you can compensate appropriately. Yeah. EQ. Also, have fun, also find out is the balcony open? Are yeah. all the levels of the balcony open? And if not, just shut yeah. those uh, speakers off that are hitting those you know those boxes because they're not doing anyone any good, and they're just firing into empty space, muddying up your entire mix. Yeah, that's a great, that's a very good tip. I mean, I, I've definitely been in places where there's a balcony and, uh, and if I, if I hadn't have checked of whether it was going to be open or not, I would have mm -hmm. put the whole PA on, but cutting the top third of the PA cleaned everything up in the rest of the room. Yeah. Much, much better. So totally. Um, well, let's, so let's, let's talk about our arena setups. Um, CJ, you've been, you've been doing a lot of arenas the past year. Uh, can you talk, I guess, mostly about the role of a systems engineer, someone who will be uh, accompanying you at front of, since you're, you're mixing in front of the house, you have someone there who's um, helping set up the PA every day, uh, making sure it's implemented correctly in every room, uh, someone who actually knows the PA int intimately well uh, mm -hmm. and who's on tour with you. Can you uh, kind of explain that role? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Our system engineer, who you guys know, his name's Matt Van Hook. Uh, he's with Claire. We carry uh, Claire Co. 12s and CP 218s. Um, and, you know, like Dave was saying, you know, a lot of 
what is sold in a venue, especially at an arena level, it's more focused on what's sold versus what's not, um, you know, as opposed to smaller clubs where you, everybody can just kind of spread out and do their own thing. These are like assigned seats in the stands or you're on the floor. Um, so walking into each venue, if you're not consistently selling a tour, like you said, there might be the whole upper mezzanine that um, doesn't need to even be looked at, or you might be selling on a 180 line instead of a 270, you know, so do you need to cover all of those zones, you know, rather than just having a left, right, do you need a side hang and do you need a rear hang to make sure that people that are paying for those seats can actually, you know, intelligently hear what's going on, you know, and that's, and that's a big thing, you know, so they're not coming back saying, oh, this show was awful. I couldn't hear anything or like complaining to Live Nation saying, I want my money back. So there is um, a lot of, you know, some pressure or just responsibility on the system engineer that, um, you know, puts in and has all these venue CADs in a software to see, you know, how we hang the PA, um, you know, and, and sometimes we might go in the morning of and kind of have to you know, dance around with lighting or video going like, hey, can you move your PA off stage two feet on each side, you know, so, and you kind of have to go back to the software and redraw, make sure that we're hitting all of our zones and stuff like that. So the system engineer has a lot of responsibility to make sure that the show is heard the way that it's intended to, you know, at a large scale, so, you know, the stakes are a little bit higher and um, yeah, everybody needs to hear the show. Yeah, I mean, I guess I should, we should explain first of all that, and I, some people are, really surprised when they hear this but every arena show the pa systems are going up every day you know it's not like there are pa systems that exist in in madison square garden that you can just roll in and use they really do go in every day and they're it's it's changeable exactly where they hang for the different shows so there is a lot of setup and planning for each every arena show yeah. um so yeah that's where the system engineer really comes in handy um you know, sometimes if you're rolling in for like a one-off or something, you might use uh, a local sound company to bring in their PA system and set up. But like we're talking about, um, you were touring with with Claire. Um, it was a huge touring company, um, and using their proprietary PA system, but which is which is awesome. I got a mix on it a bunch last last year. It, was, it sounded great. Matt did a really good job of yeah. tuning that system up. It was, it was nice. So, yeah. um, so. Dave, can you explain more uh, when we kind of get into uh, arenas, what the different zones are in the, for a PA system? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really uh, in in a similar way to, you know, how I was ex explaining, you might have under balcony hangs or something like that. It's just really that same sort of theory extrapolated in that you're going to have people that are standing right in front of the stage that need to be able to hear the mix. You're going to have people standing back further, closer to front of house that need to hear the mix. You're going to have people in, you know, the 100 zone of seating up on a mezzanine in the 200s, further up into 300 sections. They might be in front, they might be to the side, they might be, if you're selling in 360, directly behind, um, you know, what you would consider the back of the stage normally and you essentially just need a pa system that covers all of that and you're going to have a left and right that's facing forward like cj said side hangs that are you know trying to hit a 180 or a 270 you might have rear hangs that are trying to hit a 360 and then those boxes on each line array they'll typically be clustered into uh, it depends on the PA manufacturer, but often be, you know, clusters of three boxes. So uh, when you hang the PA and someone's standing right under it, the PA is angled down at them, you'll want to trim that zone of PA uh, back in volume because you don't want to be pushing the exact same volume out of that box to the people standing under it as you do to the people that are 200 feet away up three levels of uh seating um which obviously need to be louder because they're further away right? yeah it, it's crazy kind of how complicated it gets if you do have your front hangs and your side hangs and your mm -hmm. rear hangs and each one of those line arrays has different zones within it um that might have different 
uh, EQs and different volumes. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it, it gets it gets pretty complicated pretty fast. And um, I don't know when when pe some people ask about like what jobs are available in our industry. That always is a, is one that I explain to people. Some people like perk up and be like, I want to do that. Like implementing yeah. those big PA systems, being able to uh, look at drawings and run. Uh, computer systems to show them where all the speakers should be hung and going in there and, and tweaking it out. It's, it's really, really complicated and a, and a huge job. That's cool that people are excited. Absolutely. About. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know when you get into doing it, I think for me, it's just like, I want to mix shows. Right. So mm -hmm. I didn't realize that eventually there was going to be a separate monitor desk, you know, <laughs> like started right. getting into bigger tours. Like, Oh, there's, there are people that just do that. Just mix in ears. That's a whole separate uh, skill set that, frankly, I don't have. I know people that are great at it, and yeah. they're really in demand. Um, but then there are, there are different audio tech positions and system engineer positions and all, all kinds of different things you can do at, at, at a kind of larger scale tour. So yeah. it's, 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 in, it's interesting um, and something I, I try to illuminate a little bit here with some of these videos. But um, let's see. Uh, Anything else with arena sound? What about sub? What about sub arrangements in in arenas? Um, if we're getting to all the different zones, we did talk about flying subs, some and having some on the on the ground. Um, like, I guess the easy question is, how many subs would you have at say like Madison Square Garden, like eighteen thousand, twenty thousand person show? CJ, what you guys have? I'm trying to count. <laughs> <laughs> also, also, this would, it would completely depend on, I would say, the the artist and and what they're trying to get stylistically, as well as the PA manufacturer, like what type of sub. Um, you know, like your uh, like the the Claire subs, um, the CP two eighteens, and the L acoustics. Uh, what are they? The are they? K KS28s? Yeah, the, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. We typically need less of them than like taking in a J sub or something. Like mm -hmm. I usually feel the CP218s, you need about half the count that you do most other subs. So I, I think it probably completely de depends on sure. uh, that, that, but. And that's, that's a good point, style, like you were saying, stylistically. I mean, I want to. I could be wrong, but I think we got 16 or 18 subs, yeah. um, you know, all kind of halved out between what's flown and what's on the ground, you know, but for, you know, a hip hop show like Drake, you know, you might, you might want 24 subs or, yeah. you know, maybe a few more. And it's not necessarily for, for volume and power. It's really for coverage, you know, cause that style of music, it's very, low end heavy, whether it's synth bass going, there's just a, like a ton of sub information going on. So, so we're really bringing in more doesn't mean that it's going or that it should be louder, but just so you can have that feel covered more, you know, versus Dave working for Portugal, the man, you know, a rock band that's, you know, still has sub information. Every, every show needs low end, but it probably doesn't need as much as Drake does. Yeah. I, I remember, I remember seeing a, I was working over at Terminal Five in New York, and I remember like seeing a Bass Nectar show load in, and they opened the truck, and it was just pretty much all subs. And there's so many subs in that room anyway, but they're like, right. "No, we need to bring in our like 30 extra subs to like a 3,000 cap club." <laughs> so yeah, I guess stylistically, it, it does make a difference. EDM always with all the subs. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, so so people are posting some links here. That, to some different webinars in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll repost these on a, my resources page, everyone, um, and I'll send you a link to that tomorrow and a replay to this webinar as well. So stay tuned for that, but there's a ton of good stuff to learn. And if you do wanna go deep with some of these like bigger system implementations and stuff, um, checking out material from L Acoustics and D&B and, and Meyer is, is the best way to go. Those guys are the, the experts at some of this large system implementation. Definitely. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, CJ, you, you worked with Claire a bunch. Uh, can you explain the relationship kind of between you working for the artist and the PA, the audio company you hire to provide all the audio systems for you for your tour? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I think, I don't remember the first time. It's, it was a couple years ago that I heard the new Co-12 boxes. And, and like, um, like all the brands that you just mentioned, you know, DMB, L Acoustics, you know, they're so, they're so smart and obviously have spent so much money and time on R&D, not just on their boxes, but they have their own system processing and system processors and stuff like that. Um, that is, that, you know, you could just spend days trying to either mess up your system or retune your system, um, you know, but Claire, I love Claire because they are the, they're probably the most DIY company out there. They make their own boxes um, they make their own cases, um, you know, all their own speakers and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, they're, I think, I think what I love about Claire so much, and I think works well, me working with Khalid, um, cause he's a very dynamic singer and mostly on the lower spectrum. I mean, you know, he goes from anything from like whisper singing to, you know, almost yelling. And I found with those boxes and the way that they're structured through the processing and their amps, there's just a lot more headroom and especially for the top boxes rather than the subs and why you can almost get away with not bringing or using as many subs, which saves the tour a lot more money is I think the top boxes have a lot more usable low end than a lot of the other stuff than DNB or L acoustics, which sound phenomenal, but there's not as much like usable low end and low mids and stuff like that that actually doesn't sound muddy it's you know actually an essential part of your mix so yeah um that's you know with khalid singing soft and being able to not have to rely on um you know hitting hitting the amps or or anything like that with with really making it loud and proud um i think having the headroom doesn't always mean you need to use it but just having it there, whether it's the, you know, the top boxes or the sub boxes, just having it there is a little more comforting and, you know, in case you need to get there in certain rooms. I mean, I think most PAs sound better if you're running them in the green, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is, mm -hmm. which is a good place to live. And I guess here's another uh, important topic when we're talking about mixing arena shows. If you do have these huge PA systems in there that are capable of really like destroying your eardrums at 130 yeah. dB. I mean, you don't have to mix that loud. You probably shouldn't mix that loud. Right. Um, can you guys, can, Dave, can you maybe talk about like mixing shows at that level, like, and trying to deal with volume versus even like trying to overcome the acoustics of a bad arena? Like where, how do you find yeah, a fine I'm, line? To, where does it to feel? I mean, there's, uh, I mean, an another big thing if you're mixing pop shows as well is just the volume of the crowd and, right. you know, trying to in, in a loud pop show, I mean, you, the, the crowd is peaking at 110 to 120 dB and you're, you're not going to beat that. It's just a, it's just a losing battle oh, I've sure. always found. So one, one of the things, no matter what the show is, is I carry around with me like a, 1510 Pelican case and as part of my setup anywhere I go is I have a, a reference microphone and it's calibrated and I have smart and I set it up at every single show so I can meter the volume I'm mixing at and it depends I mean if we're for doing something like you know if it's corporate shows we've been doing a bunch of like charity and, and whatever stuff with Portugal men Recently, I typically try and hit about 95 dB a weighted average over 10 minutes. Um, for people that might not understand that, it's just an average level of uh, an a weighted dB is typically what the human ear hears. So it's weighted towards the high mid frequencies, which is the stuff that's going to damage your hearing anyway. If we're indoors at uh, clubs or arenas, it's you know, I try and, and hit about 102 dB. And if we're outdoors where um, it doesn't need to be that loud, I, I try and normally hit about 100 dB. And yeah. that way it's, you know, I mean, they're a very guitar heavy band, obviously. So a lot of it's, it's mid range. And uh, by doing that, I, I feel like I'm still able to get a full and powerful mix uh, sort of up front and forward. And it's, it's maintaining a pretty reasonable level while doing it. 
Yeah, I guess it again, it is a, a stylistic thing depending on, on whom you're mixing. Uh, totally. I mean, dance, if, if it's, a, if it's, a, it's a, yeah, I mean, if it's a, if it's a smaller club um, and we're trying to get over some stage volume, like it goes louder, you know, right. there's, there, there's not a lot I can do around that, but you know, I've, I found by a, for, for me, at least my ears are super sensitive to high mid frequencies and, and I get tired easy. So that was one, one of the reasons why I, I started doing that because I'm like, I'm only, you know, not as only as a bad for the audience, but I'm out here doing this every single night. I'm trying to protect myself as well. And uh, I mean, you can mix louder, but it's just uh, everyone's ears get tired and, and the fatigue starts wearing in and people aren't hearing, you know, the, everyone's ears start compressing and uh, that volume isn't achieved as much anyway. So, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I've been able to work with some dynamic artists so you can make the quiet stuff really quiet and the loud stuff really loud. And then it sort of averages out in the middle. So I, I, I've kind of noticed that my ears get much tired much more tired, even at like around 100 dB on like mm -hmm. console digital consoles that run at 48k versus like an analog console. I feel like the volume's a little. Different. Huh. Do you have you guys found that? I mean, it, it, it's a stretch, I guess. But I haven't, I haven't noticed that, but it, that does make sense. I mean, I would I would say something running through an analog console would be a little a little less hard. Every input is going to be a little bit less harsh, a little more rounded off than you know. Um, some sort of digital trim on a preamp kind of thing. It's not really running through a bunch of wires and circuits and stuff and all the things that, you know, kind of just warm up any given input. So that does make yeah. sense. It's interesting. Well, that's, I mean, to, I've, I mean, most of the stuff I mix is at 96, so I haven't noticed that, but um, that doesn't surprise me at all. And I'm going to throw the fancy term, the Nyquist theory at you. So at, at 48 K, anything that is at, at a 24 kilohertz uh, sine wave is it's not a sine wave anymore it's a triangle wave so mm -hmm. um, you know if you have that again and you're talking about a 12 uh, 12 kilohertz sine wave which is you know I mean people like sibilance is up there um, symbols are up there the top end of guitars if you aren't high passing them aggressively enough since they're up there all that stuff which might be uh if it was on an analog console or at a higher sample rate something that might be uh sounding smooth isn't smooth anymore it's basically being square waved at 12 kilohertz so you're not only getting the 12k you're getting all the uh harmonics kind of clipping above that as well so that that makes a lot of sense yeah, it's it's that kind of that harshness of early digital recordings mm -hmm. to me, just kind of amplified, and like really, you know, if you're listening to that at 100 100 dB, a yeah. you know, it's like well, you know, well, yeah. it's I mean, even it's it's amazing just what volume will do as well. Like if you've ever tried to tune a PA to like ACDC, it sounds terrible when you play it at 100 <laughs> dB, you know, because it's just some of those little guitar frequencies that aren't uh they sort of give it character at a lower level you go and play them at, at that volume and it's just it's crazy to me at, at least um my my ears pick up that stuff really easy and it's just harsh there was a point i was trying to tune pas with a zz top song and it was just like it was just it was all that i would turn it up and i would start notching all this stuff out because those guitars same mm -hmm. thing, guitars all this frequency would start to like yeah. drive crazy and then it ended up with a bad sounding pa to like two yeah out. so i've I've, stopped yeah. I've been i've been there <laughs> yeah. um so all right so let's talk about uh uh tuning up tuning a pa again you know it's um it's it's good to have a, your own uh, song you know really well that you use to tune a pa but is there something you approach differently at a in an arena versus a small club if you're just tuning a pa by ear. Mm -hmm. Dave, you go first. All right. Um, <clears throat> so the way it's it's it took me years to get, I guess, the rhythm into doing this, but 
I, I think I'm at a, a point now where I feel really comfortable with my approach to tuning PAs. And it's that I approach it in two steps at this point. <clears throat> the first is, like I said, I always bring uh, like a smart uh, microphone, uh, like a reference microphone and smart with me. And what I do is um, I'll set the the mic up in you know either to to one side of the PA or in the middle of the room wherever I feel like it's probably going to give me a sort of average reading and I use the transfer function on smart and pink noise to get me in the ballpark of having a, a flat PA um because what I what I found is that my ear tends to adjust pretty quickly to if you have a bad sounding PA or a bad room, it tends to adjust to that and my ear starts compensating. So what I like to do is turn off, I guess, the critical listening part of my brain first off and get the PA. So it's more or less give or take looking a little flat, align subs if I need to do that, align front fills if I need to do that. Um, set the sub level so it's it's giving me roughly what I think it needs to be. And then I move from pink noise into tuning with music and sort of refine that a little bit, but mostly once it, it gets to the music point, um, unless something's drastically wrong, I sort of take off that transfer function and then start listening by ear because I guess that there's two things there's there is uh you don't always necessarily want a PA to be perfectly flat in a room um yeah. and the other thing is if you start uh I mean there's only so much you can do with a measurement microphone anyway it's not going to give you all those little harsh frequencies if it's just like if it's a tiny bit that's sticking out that your ear might be able to so i can generally go in and sweep for frequencies listening listen to what's particularly bad and standing out and you know drop that or like i said before go up to the top of the room find out what's the worst sounding frequencies which your measurement microphone uh down on the floor isn't going to pick up as much of and take that out and start making more, I guess, creative decisions about how you're tuning a PA than the scientific, let's get it flat. So at least, you know, I like to get in the ballpark with smart and know I'm painting on a pretty, you know, flat kind of uh, blank canvas and then tune from there, um, which is different. I mean, I, I don't claim to be a system tech, a real system tech will have multiple microphones out averaging things before any of that happens, I'm not that person, but I, I feel like it's a middle ground between being able to go out there and tune solely with your ear and uh, relying on the technology to get you a super flat PA from uh, different points using you know measurements that you can justify. Yeah. CJ, uh, with your, your tips for tuning, tuning. Oh, I guess one more question, Dave, actually. Mm -hmm. um, do you always use subtractive EQ uh, when you're, say, when you're doing overall system EQ? You, you no. do some boosting sometimes. It's well, it's it's pretty much always. That's a great question. Uh, pretty much always subtractive EQ, unless I really feel like something needs to be boosted, which most of the time ends up being if I'm outdoors and yeah, not getting enough. Uh, high end um, and then that might not even be in uh, you know uh, I pretty much spec on a rider that I need to have a lake at front of house because I think they sound great and that additive EQ is not always necessarily coming from the lake it might be digging into you know finding the system engineer that's there and going into the PA program and it might just need to be like the top boxes need to have a high end boost on them because they're trying to shoot further, um, further back and 
the air absorption is just sucking those high frequencies. So you want to give them a bit more of a fighting chance to, to get 150 feet from the stage. Yeah, that's good if you can develop that good relationship with a system engineer. If you if you don't have your own, if you're not touring with your own system engineer and you're rolling yeah. in and, and dealing with someone, it goes back to just kind of being nice to people when you show up for a gig. Because <laughs> exactly. you, you might yeah. need to like have someone help you adjust some PA sit settings if they're if they're willing to. But yeah. I agree. There's, yeah. there's there's even been, you know, like uh, on that being nice to people, it's like, you know, we just did uh, a festival, I can't remember where it was, a few weeks ago. Um, and we were not the headliner. We were second from the top. I think Dave, this would have been, uh, innings fest in Arizona and Dave Matthews band was headlining. They'd already sound checked. I went to go tune a PA and I pulled the system engineer aside and, you know, we'd been talking, we're in a decent rapport by the time. And I said, Hey, the sub coverage in the middle is you know, way off, can we turn the subs up like 3 dB in the middle? And he was telling me why I did it a specific way. And I said, that's great. Can we just try it? See if it throws off what you were doing. And then he was cool with it. And we just, you know, rolled with that for, for the day. Cause it, we were able to find a point where it was a middle ground that made me happy. It wasn't destroying the reason where he had them down to begin with. And mm -hmm. yeah, I just generally think on, on gigs, be nice to people. No one wants to go in and, and have a, a terrible day. You're already working long hours. If you're outdoors doing summer tours, it's already hot. Everyone's annoyed at everyone by default. Like, <laughs> yeah. All right, C CJ, what's some P PA tuning tips? What's your, what's your general approach? Mostly by ear or do you use, do you use smart as well? Um, I do. I use smart, but it, it's mostly by ear. I mean, these days on my tour, I'm the production manager as well. So I rely very heavy and trust very much uh, my system engineer, Matt. Um, so he will, he will time the whole thing um, and then he'll play Careless Whisper on repeat and annoy everybody for a little bit or serenade some people. And, um, and usually, so I'll come out of the production office and then I have, I play Billie Jean um, and which has like a lot of low, frequency information, you know, especially playing back through a PA. So I find if I can kind of tame that, um, you know, that's kind of, it's, it kind of starts to live where, where I want it. Um, but I, more than that, I'll mostly reply or rely on vir my virtual sound check from the night before and actually hearing what my mix sounds like and, and kind of tuning to that. And because a lot of times I've found, you know, if you're, if you're really trying to make a PA system sound badass with whatever song that you know super well, you know, which is a good ballpark for getting you there. But if you're fortunate enough to carry your own console, carry your own PA, you know what it's supposed to sound like. And if it's just not hitting when you play back your recording um, in a certain way, you know, then it's like, you know, I know all of us use snapshots and and there's, there's probably sometimes you just snap to a different song um, and then you're just like, whoa, this thing is tearing my head off and it wasn't like this yesterday. and you know, arenas are pretty similar shaped, but depending on how much absorption's in the room or if the seats are padded or hard or something like that, that can be a huge difference maker. So, I mean, that's why like I safe pretty much all my drums and sometimes I'm just like, you know, maybe my mix doesn't need more kick drum, but in this room, it needs more kick drum. So it's not just on this song. It's like this room just needs more kick drum. Um, but I, I mean, to be honest with, with tuning a PA, you know, at all levels and especially at a club level, that's why I really love mixing live music versus the studio, you know, studio, studio mix, you know, you have to live with that once you commit to it forever, at least in a live setting, you know, you, you can, if you, you know, I've, I've done small shows where I don't have time to listen to the PA um, because, you know, load in was five o'clock, sound check was six o'clock and we had a hundred problems in between and you know the artists and we have to be done by seven before doors and, or there's two other bands that have to sound check you know sometimes you don't have very much time to listen to a system you know at a five in a 500 cap club so it's, you might just be literally hacking your inputs into you know whatever system tuning might or might not be going on yeah. you know but but at least like you know that approach you 
you can leave it there at the end of the night or what if you do have to just mix to the room or you have limited time you know be like okay this is this is a good starting point you know where am i going to make up you know the time that i didn't have on the system you know i need more subs but you know then do i turn up just my sub output a little bit you know but then you start hitting the amps a little bit harder so it's it's a way to shoot yourself in the foot a little bit too but you know fact of the matter is you know probably most of the people watching this they're not going to have a lot when they do their gigs they're not going to have a lot of time to tune the system to pull out smart and to kind of like retime things and stuff like that you know because you're running monitors you had five bad cables that kind of thing so really just if you do have a song or can play back a recording and really know, you know, pick two things that you're really focusing on, you know, how much sub energy or, you know, I know my singer, you know, 4K is usually a problem or something like that, you know, really just kind of like, just pick a few things that you know you should or could notch out and and just kind of go from there. Cause I mean, you know, even at, you know, the arena level that we're doing right now, I don't have very much time to listen to the system because I'm doing a bunch of other things, you know, in the production world. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think just like, you know, act like you don't have all the time in the world and get things done quick. And then if you do have extra time, you know, play around with, you know, getting, getting things flatter or, you know, taking out more harsh frequencies, whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, that's great. And uh, Joanne, Thanks uh, in the chat asking about how to do this efficiently. Yeah, I think, you know, really having that one song that you know, choosing to address one or two important things for your show, uh, that's a great way to just kind of go in and quickly do it by ear. Obviously, yeah, smart is a whole other level, but in a small club, being able to run in there and really know what something sounds like, addressing the subs, ad knowing what it sounds like in the middle of the room and at the soundboard, if the soundboard yeah. is in a different position. I think those mm -hmm. few things start there, you'll be in, in great shape. So um, I'm gonna start addressing some of these questions that have come up uh, from Ricky. Do, do, you still, do you still try to mix a stereo image or do you find it mix more in mono uh, to deal with that much coverage in an arena or stadium level? I mean, I know we've, I've talked in other videos about mostly in live sound, trying to keep things mono or if it's a maybe a stereo keyboard panning that stuff, but uh, does that change when it gets up, up into an arena? Um, what do you guys What do you guys feel like? Well, I I have a question that might uh, influence how that that's done. Um, do you guys, when you have your side hangs, do you typically so you've got your left and right, and then do you typically flip your side hangs so you've got the yeah a left coming from the, the, the right side and then a right coming from the left, because I know there are people that are very uh, opinionated on this and think the left side hang should be on the left side of the PA and the right side hang should, side hang should be on the right side of the PA. And was that CJ you said yet yeah, where you like to flip it. And I think that's really smart because then you can sort of push that coverage from the other side out the other side of the, the stage. And I, I don't understand the logic to not doing that, but I, I, I know there are people that are pretty opinionated about keeping left, left and right with right. I mean, I, I, I do the same thing. I, I alternate them. So and yeah. it, it, if, if people are having trouble visualizing this, there's like, uh, if say the left side of the PA system in an arena might have a, the main hang, then a side hang, and then a rear hang even maybe. So if you alternate those left, right, left, you still get some of that stereo information on one side. I mean, I think that's what I've always done. Um, mm -hmm. And it does it does let you pan a little bit more and not worry that if you pan a guitar to the right side, nobody on the left is gonna hear it. Right. But those issues still do exist some. CJ, what, how do you tend to approach it? Yeah, I mean, I, I do the same thing, you know, which is essentially, you know, two sets of left, rights, essentially. Um, so yeah, left, right, left, right. And, and yeah, I think especially with, you know, most, most any artist has, um, or is relying on, you know, more playback tracks to kind of help supplement or fill, fill some space, you know, for maybe there's minimal band members on stage or something like that. So a lot of, and a lot of those produced tracks have a lot of stereo imaging information you know that you're not going to get if if those side hangs are in mono and stuff like that and you know you could walk a room for yourself and you do it does make a difference it creates a little bit of space and especially 
if you're having everything sitting on top of each other and the most important channel on the stage is the vocalist. So if you can create that space, um, you know, between a left and a right, you know, it leaves more room in the middle for the kick drum and the vocal and, and that kind of thing. I think, I think it makes a big difference. Whatever, whatever you can throw to the sides, the better. Cool. All right, uh, let's, let's take Derek's question here. Uh, personally, I have a smaller Meyer line array and a number of other Meyer boxes. Would you prefer to add a Meyer Galileo or a Lake? I guess just talking about the difference between the two. I have seen a lot of people use <clears throat> Galileos just as their general EQing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're really great uh, processors. Um, they're specifically built to manage Meyer uh, speaker systems. So they do have that functionality specifically, but um, personally, I, I prefer the EQ on a lake. I think it's more detailed. Um, uh, do you guys have an opinion? Would you, do you, I know Dave, you said you always use a lake. And I yeah, I, th I, th I think they're probably two different purposes. Um, I don't know how to use Galileo, but I would add a Galileo as the first step because for the reason that you said, they're specifically built to manage Maya boxes and there's a lot more detail that you can go into them specifically with a Maya system. Um, and then I think if you could do it on top of that, add a like because I like the, the EQ functionality yeah of of that and i love the way a lake eq sounds but mm -hmm. i think they're they have a lot of crossover in the functionality what you can do but kind of two different purposes yeah. as well yeah yeah and i think i think just the the interface of the lake it's it's a lot more widely known with <laughs> sound engineers um you know like whether it's the l acoustic system or a galileo all these proprietary uh, speaker managing, you know, processors and stuff, you know, they're very, they are very smart. They're very in depth, they're very detailed, but they're, they're also like kind of hard to learn if you don't already know it. So to really, mm -hmm. so like Dave was saying, even if you carry your own lake and put it into, put your outputs into the Galileo processor and let them do their job from there. Um, yeah, I think, I think lake is just a lot more user-friendly and the band's, you know, the, the EQ bands and, and just kind of versatility, I think is, it's just, a, it's just a lot quicker, I think. Yeah, it's, it's a great way just to interface a console and the, the system processor, whatever, yeah. whatever the yeah. processor is for, for the speaker system you're using. Um, pretty much every time I'm out doing shows, it's, I have a lake and I send the outputs of the lake. Those are my drive lines that I give to either the person, either my systems engineer or whoever is providing the PA system. So um, I, I find they, they work great, so. Well, and that um, too, it also, it also gives you more control if you are in, you know, a mid-sized club or a theater or something where, you know, maybe there is like a stingy house engineer there that day who may disagree with how they have their system timed or, um, you know, tuned. It gives you the flexibility to be able to correct what you think are those mistakes you know, from your end, driving into their system rather than having to, you know, spend a bunch of time trying to dive into their settings and they're, they don't want to touch them and that kind of thing. It gives you the flexibility to, you know. Yeah. And, and that's, that's super common, I, I guess, just on touring in general and you go into some place and people have things set up the way they ha have it set up and you just kind of have to let the, let it go. And having a lake mm -hmm. does let you, you know, usually we run lake on a tablet. So, you're able to walk around the club and really like maybe walk up to the front fills at the front of the stage and adjust the the timing on that to make sure that they're uh, time aligned with the main system. I mean, I do that by ear sometimes even, uh, mm -hmm. but just to be able to go and hear things and, and walk around the venue and make sure everything's just kind of sitting in a, in a good spot. It's easier than if you have to be at the console, adjusting EQs on the console or adjusting delay times on the console. It just makes everything so much easier if you have your master control on your lake, totally. able to walk around a club with the tablet and kind of take care of problems. So. Also, uh, timing front fills by ear is very underrated. <laughs> yeah, I do it, I do it all the time. It's, yeah, I, I love timing front fills by ear. I, I think it's uh, a great way to do it. So I, I have this, speaking of like having a song to do, to do certain things, there's a, there's a doo-wop song that I have that has like this sh a shaker on, mm -hmm. just on the left side. So I'll, 
I'll play that and tune the front fills. If I just hear that shaker shaking and play around with the delay time, mm -hmm. standing right in front of the fills and to where I hear it coming out of the left side of the PA system and through the fills, if I can get it lined up really well by ear, I feel like I'm, it's almost always better than if I'm just kind of doing what's ever there built in the club, usually like yeah. two or three milliseconds different. I don't know. It, it usually works cool. really well for me. But you you know, cool. a lot of the time I'll uh, tune front fills to pink noise because you can kind of, it, it's, it's really weird. It's almost like you, you can almost visualize the image shifting from the PA to the front field directly in front of you when, when you do that. It's, I don't know. It's, I, I don't do it all the time, but sometimes I do. And I've found out it works really well. Yeah. Uh, one thing I always, I also do when I'm on tour, even if I'm not carrying a PA system, I usually carry my own front fills with me just so I know the state, the sound coming from the stage is going to be super consistent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, let's uh, go through a couple more of these questions. Uh, Dennis says, do you play in different venues and how do you make adjustments to your show file when you're playing in smaller venues? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think that the show, show file really is, any show file is mostly con concerned with the inputs, right? So everything coming from stage, you have your gains set and your compressors set and EQ set. And so you're, I think generally from, any venue to any venue, mostly what you're changing in your show file is the outputs. Yeah. Um, but I know, Dave, go ahead. Uh, I mean, the, I, I agree with that. The only thing I'll tend to change is um, I'm dealing a lot with, you know, guitars and, and stage volume. So I run everything through groups. And so I'll just turn those groups up or or down, which is typically ends up being guitar and, and bass. Like keys and vocals aren't going to change. Uh, drums are just going to be loud anyway. So it's like, you know, if I need less guitar at that at that show, I'll just bring the guitar group down and then everything else will be about the same. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I think just generally thinking about a show file being a sound reinforcement again, instead of building a full complete <laughs> mix, that's going to be like ironclad, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you're, yeah, you'll need to take those guitars down by six dB just to make it not crazy in the room. So, um, yeah. I think that, yeah, CJ. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I'd say with, I mean, with any, with any show file, especially if you're, say you're at a level where you're carrying your own console consistently. Um, so you're on the same console working on that show file every night, but you're in different clubs with different PA systems. Um, yeah, that's, that's a prime example of where you should have your mix really ballparked and really focusing on the outputs. Um, but really, I mean, there's, we've, we've all done rooms where you're really, there are some days you're just really struggling with the PA. You're like, this does not sound like my mix. This PA is just not receiving the mix the way that it should be, or the way that it has been or something like that. Um, so at the same time, I'm never really afraid to stray away from something even if even if it's for a night or a couple nights or something like it's like all right i'm just gonna have to during the show you know i need to start bringing these frequencies in or start dumping these out you know of my inputs sometimes just to so you're not so committed um and afraid to change anything uh because because i mean i find that there's just there's just sometimes some nights you just can't win and you may have to just completely you know compress less or just you know do some pretty heavy-handed moves and not be afraid to do that if there's a night where your mix just is not translating whatsoever no matter how hard you work on the outputs yeah no totally and yeah. i yeah you have to be flexible every room is going to be different every scenario is going to be different it is one of the fun things about doing the job is you do get to figure out those problems every night but no absolutely yeah you should do whatever needs to get done to make sure the show sounds good that night yeah the show you're in for sure. And then ditch that short file for the next one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I know I've, I've done that a lot. If I'm, if I'm on a PA that does not sound good and I find myself mm -hmm. starting to do major EQ changes. Yeah. It's absolutely, I'll have the, a safer kind of go-to show file. Yeah. I'll revert back to for the next show and then just yeah. discard yeah. it. <laughs> one night only. <laughs> um, I'm going to take this uh, question from Madeline. 
uh, I guess I'll answer this because I, I do know this venue, but she says, any tips for mixing in places like Warsaw and Brooklyn, meaning untreated and generally e echoey and washy sounding? Um, it's a tough venue, but number one tip for, for that venue specifically is the low end sounds way different on the floor than it does up in the sound booth. So make sure that you get, especially when, the, when that room is full, and this is so common with a lot of cl small clubs like this, if you're in the back of the room and up on a on a balcony, you're not going to hear the sa subs the same way as you will on the floor. They're way louder on the floor, especially with full of people. So, as you're doing the show, even when the show starts, kind of just take a step off the front of house perch in the back, and just give get a sense of how the subs sound on the floor. That's kind of my my tip for for that venue and a lot of small venues that that size. But have you guys ever mixed in there, Warsaw? No, I have. It, it, you have CJ. Yeah, once a while ago. Yeah, and yeah, it's I mean, and especially in a room like that, which is it's common for that size, you know, especially when you're in a booth, sub frequency specifically, like you're decoupled from the rest of the crowd. So the rest of the crowd is feeling that vibration on the floor, you know, and you're completely, you know, on a pedestal decoupled from that. So not only are you hearing it differently, you're feeling it differently. So it's definitely important that you have to walk around the room and feel those frequencies, or you know get get back in your sound booth and don't feel those frequencies and know that you're you know so you're not mixing all the time to sound good from the sound booth you just have to know where things are living and kind of trust that you know that be like okay the subs are feeling good down there even though i can't hear them too much up there i'm not going to keep boosting these um i'm going to take one more question from danielle um, and then, then we'll be done here, guys. But um, we're going back to the lake system here. She says, do you feel prohibited with the lake's floor outputs? What if zone, more zone coverage is needed? Um, Good question. Yeah, I mean, you just you use more lakes, I guess. <laughs> you start, you start, they're, they're easy to da daisy chain the LM44s. And I think that's kind of the way to get around that. I usually just tour with one of those units. It's, you know, it's four outputs, but that, generally does enough for front of house. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I, I think you get into the, the what purpose you're using it for as well. And it's, um, if, if, if you're trying to matrix everything out from it, you're really getting into using it as a, um, I, I guess, distributing your system where typically as front of house engineers, that's not our main use of it, it's taking it's we're trying to interface our mix with distribution into system drive. And what we typically use it for is just EQ, maybe a little timing, and then from there hand it off to the system engineer or the venue or PA company or, or whoever, which should in theory have their own distribution in place. And usually, usually I find if I need more, it's just for weird things like there might be a like an extra hearing loop which that doesn't need to come from a lake at all that can just come straight from the console um or just weird things like that it's it's very rare where i find myself running out of outputs from it and because because i don't use um i don't use an oxen for subs or front fills i matrix everything from the left right i typically carry the the lm26 so I get an extra two outputs from that if I need to use them anyway. And you don't have separate EQ or delay time control or anything off from, but I can spit out two extra outputs if it's needed. Cool. Yeah, yeah, like you said, Dave, I mean, really, the, if you're a front of house engineer carrying one, usually the primary use is gonna be for left, right, sub and fills. Don't really need more than that, but I mean, it's, but obviously it's not uncommon Oh, there's a camera crew coming tonight. We need a left, right feed. Oh, and there's a hearing impaired section and there's mm -hmm. a bar fill section and, um, you know, on and on and on. So usually, yeah, it's those can just, you can just reserve some separate outputs on the console for those, or, you know, you can have one that you just give, you know, the person, you know, the house system with the Galileo and then they can distribute the bar fill and the hearing impaired and all that kind of stuff, you know, just whatever you have, just let it be the way you're going to use it, you know, and, and your utility. And yeah, you don't need to worry about carrying extra lakes for a hearing impaired uh, or a, a bar fill, you know, output or anything like that. Yeah, and that's generally how it should be set up. You know, we, 
we think about the drive lines from front of the house as being four different zones, generally, left, right, subfill, um, and then everything beyond that should be a separate distribution system um, from the person, the engineer managing the PA system, the entire PA system. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, all right, guys, thanks for coming on. Uh, before we go, uh, tell me what you're up to while you're stuck at home. Tell me one good project you have set up for this week to, to work on. Or do you have any projects set up this week to work on? I <laughs> uh, can't, can't talk about it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> I, I've been moving house uh, the last week, so that's been awesome. Feeling settled in now? No, oh, okay. <laughs> I have so many boxes to unpack. So, so that's a good yep. project for the week then. Yep, project. Uh, CJ, you uh, you doing any uh, studio mixing or anything? Um, well, me and uh, me and my girlfriend have been uh, just writing some stupid little jingles, just to try and stay creative and um, kill some time, and as well as you know, just work on some music. Nothing serious, but just trying to uh, go on a run every day, eat well, and just write some jingles and maybe watercolor. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. You know, it's been tough to exercise around here because you know you walk out this walk out the door and yeah you know, Manhattan, i live in manhattan the streets right. are just full of people still it's crazy but um, um well i i hope you guys stay healthy and happy and all that um thanks for coming on and talking thanks to everybody for coming hope everyone out there is staying healthy and uh we'll do this uh next tuesday um at least for a while <laughs> we'll see how long this our work stoppage goes but uh We'll be uh, we'll be chatting every every Tuesday here. Please come by and see see the next one. Uh, you'll get an email about a replay tomorrow, and also uh, an invite to the next webinar coming up this weekend. All right, bye guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. See ya.